raise your hand, ask questions as I go. I'll try to be clear, but if I'm not, be sure to stop me. So what I want to talk about um, for the next 50 minutes or something is how do I solve my structure by sad phasing, sort of continuation of what we talked about this morning, um, and focusing on uh, the anomalous signal and focusing on the methods for finding, for, the, for identification of the anomalous signal, methods for finding the heavy atom substructure, methods for phasing. Um, and yeah, the sub the subcontext here is basically, will I solve my structure with uh, sad phasing? And after this morning's lecture, uh, George came to me and said, "Well, you know, these these things are great, you know, nice tools and everything, um, but does it actually make a difference in in what I, what I think, you know, before I do my experiment?" And I, so I just wanted to give one example of that. So um, at the end of today's lecture, you'll recognize why um, you can't solve. Uh, a, an RNA structure by phosphate phasing uh, unless you have resolution of two angstroms or better. So that's going to be a, I'm not going to go through that one, but you'll, you'll know everything you need to know in order to answer uh, that question by the time in the next hour. Okay. So this is going to allow you to think about how do I plan, uh, what kind of things can I solve, what kind of things I can't uh, solve. Uh, so here's what I'm going to cover. Um, in the next few minutes, basically, uh, we're going to talk about quantifying the anomalous signal. And this is going to amplify on what I talked about uh, this morning and give more specifics to it. Um, how to estimate the anomalous signal uh, in a data set. Um, and then, then I'll talk for a few minutes about, about finding the heavy atom, the anomalous substructure, and um, tools, likelihood based tools that make this much more powerful um, than, than previously. And uh, then I'll talk about scaling and merging SAD data, the tool that I talked about. I'll give you a little bit of the background for that. And then will I solve my structure? And then a little bit about automation of th that whole process. And so let's talk about, about quantifying the anomalous signal. And let me just remind you of what I'm talking about um, with the uh, anomalous signal here. And I guess I do have a little pointer here that I can use. Um, so. This delta anomalous, this is a thing that we're basically trying to, the information we're trying to get um, in an anomalous uh, experiment, and it is defined as the magnitude of the F plus um, compared to that of uh, F minus related reflections. And they're going to be related by a simple formula here that you don't have to worry about too much uh, except to realize that it's, there is a similar formula simple formula. So this is just showing the structure factors and their relationships here. So blue here is our non-anomalous part of our structure. And for purposes of discussion now, that basically includes all our carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, all those other atoms that don't scatter very, very much anomalously. And then uh, uh, FH here is going to be the structure factor for a particular reflection corresponding to those atoms that do scatter anomalously. And the the orange part of it um, is the real part of, of that scattering. And then for anomalous, an anomalously scattering atom, there's going to be an imaginary part that's basically perpendicular to that. And that's what I've written as Fa here. And, um, and by, by the F minus reflection is actually down below. It's, oops, I didn't mean to do that. It's actually, um, for this reflection, the F minus would be down here, and we've just flipped it across the axis just to make it easy to do these diagrams. So if you do that little flipping thing, then the FA for the F minus is exactly the opposite direction as the F plus one. So the bottom line is um, we can draw how big the difference is between F plus and F minus, their magnitudes, is this delta ano, where I've made the little brackets here, and it's basically the component of this FA thing twice the component is F A thing along the direction of the black line. So that's the component is that sine alpha thing in, two, in uh, factor two. So that's basically the things we're talking about here. So we're going to measure for a particular reflection, F plus, F minus, and then we have these um, relationships showing how big uh, the anomalous difference would be for that uh, uh, reflection. And notice that depending on the orientations of these vectors, if this F H was, say, parallel to the F P, then the F plus and F minus would be basically the same. And we wouldn't have any anomalous information, even though there is an anomalous signal. So that particular reflection might not contribute. Another way to look at this is that, um, suppose we were trying to calculate a map that, that showed where all the anomalously scattering atoms were located. 
Um, if we really wanted to do that, we'd want to draw a map that consists of all these little structure factors FA. If we drew a map that, had, that, that was just using these as map coefficients, all the little FA guys, with the vector, um, that, that map would show exactly where the anomalously scattering ends are. It would be a perfect map. So we're never going to get a map that, that, that's that good because we don't measure FA. We measure the component of FA along the black line. So we always get the sine alpha term there. So that means that in all our calculations about um, anomalously scattering atoms, there's always basically a big intrinsic noise that goes along with it. So just keep that in mind. Okay, so enough about definitions. Um, so I mentioned also this morning that, so we're going to define um, this term uh, anomalous signal, and the anomalous signal is going to be the peak height of an anomalous difference Fourier phase with the correct structure, with the correct phases at the peaks of, at the coordinates of the anomalously scattering atoms. So that's our definition. And this little formula here just says that, repeats that exact same definition. Mean value of, of anomalous density at coordinates of these atoms divided by the RMS um, of that map. And as I mentioned this morning, the thing to keep in mind, typical values of this number for solid structures that get solved is like 10 to 20. And if it's 2, you're not going to solve it. So this is, this is a picture of an uh, anomalous difference Fourier map, an actual one. And you'll notice a few things about this picture. The peak heights aren't the same at all the different anomalously scattering atoms. Um, and that's partly because some are better ordered than others. Others might ha and also maybe the occupancy of um, selenium versus sulfur might be different in different ones. And so lots of different reasons why that could be. Um, but it's just the mean uh, that we're looking at here in this, these calculations. Okay. Um, so now let's talk a little bit about um, what comes into these anomalous differences. So the goal here is to try to figure out um, what are all the sources of basically noise in our experimental measurements and what are all the sources of signal and how big are these relative to each other and therefore are we going to be able to sort everything out. So that's, that's where we're trying to go here. So let's make a, we're just making a simple model here um, that describes <clears throat> contributions to the measured anomalous differences. And maybe I'll just walk over here, it'd be easier. So, so the measured anomalous differences um, really come from three big things. And one is the anomalous differences that we're actually interested in. So the ones I just showed you in the pre on two slides ago, the delta anno is F plus minus F minus sine of theta. Um, that's, that's the ones that we we're really interested in, where these are the anomalous differences coming from the atoms that we're really interested in, the ones that we want to find. So that's, that's the good part, is the delta anno. And then there's another part that's really there. So if you measure it, you'll get it. Um, and that's due to all the other minor sites, other atoms, and all that. So they all contribute anomalous differences. And so they'll contribute to this number, but we, uh, we aren't interested in them because they're just they're everywhere. So that counts as noise. And then, of course, we're going to make errors in our measurements, and that contributes as noise too. right? So those two terms on the right effectively are just noise. And, but we need to know kind of how big they are. Okay, so now let's define another thing. And I want to define, um, to, I want to describe how similar are the anomalous differences that I measure to the anomalous differences for an idealized data set, where this idealized data set has all the same protein, nucleic acid, whatever atoms, and the anomalously scattering atoms are just at, just at the positions that I'm looking for, and there's no um, Scat anomalous scattering from carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. There's no minor sites, no nothing like that. So that's the idealized situation. And I'm asking how similar, uh, I want to describe um, how similar they are for my data set to this idealized situation. And the reason to do this is um, we're going to have real data sets where we kind of know the answer and we want to compare measured anomalous differences to anomalous differences that are idealized for those real data sets. And we'll see why in a second. So let's just define this. So there's a second definition here. It's um, uh, we're going to define the correlation of observed and substructure anomalous differences and call that our anomalous correlation, CC ano. And those of you who have who've worked with anomalous data might find this slightly confusing, so I want to make sure it's clear that people have used other definitions of CC ano, right? So this one, just in today's lecture, this is what we're talking about with the anomalous correlations, the correlation between measured um, and what we really want 
that would idealize for this structure. So substructure anomalous differences. So this is just a correlation coefficient. This is just a formula for a correlation coefficient of anything. So delta ano is the thing that we met, uh, what we, uh, the substructure anomalous differences, delta ano observed, so just the mean value of the product of those things and divided by the RMS of each one. If they're suitably normalized to be, have a mean of zero, this is just your standard formula for a correlation coefficient, nothing special. And the bottom line is that this anomalous correlation basically says how much on average of each anomalous difference is going to be useful. It's how, much, how correlated those anomalous differences are to the thing that we really are interested in. And this picture is just showing that if you contour that same map I showed you before at a different level, you see there's a lot of noise in these maps. It's not like every part of these maps is um, perfect. Okay. So, um, so if we use that little formula that I showed you at the beginning for what are the different sources of, uh, of error, um, and, uh, and we just plug in uh, those number, those, those, uh, that little equation and the definitions that I just gave you, and don't use any new information except for those things. Um, I'm not going to do it for you, but I can, I'm just telling you that you can calculate a few things already. And um, so here's a formula that comes, there's no more content than what I've already told you, um, that says that the anomalous signal, we remember that anomalous signal is peak height at coordinates of anomalously scattering atoms in anomalous difference Fourier, that that number um, is going to be equal to the anomalous correlation, the correlation of measured anomalous differences with the ideal anomalous differences for that substructure, um, times a little factor here, square root of number of reflections, divided by square root of number of sites, and um, this little other factor, <coughs> F, um, which is the second moment of the anomalous scattering factor. So just ig ignore that one for the moment. Supposing that um, your uh, anomalously scattering uh, 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 atoms have, have a zero B factor, then we don't have to consider that term at all, in which case the anomalous signal would just be equal to the anomalous correlation times the square root of number of reflections divided by the square root of number of sites. So let's just understand that for a second. So if you have more reflections, um, so this anomalous signal is the peak height in anomalous difference Fourier. So that's how high the peak is, right? And how, what's going to determine how high it is? Well, if there's more reflections, um, then each reflection basically contributes a little bit more to that peak. So if you have more reflections, it's going to get bigger. And it gets bigger as the square root um, just because um, the signal goes all in the, um, on the peak and the noise goes everywhere and that turns out to be the square root in the end. And this exact same opposite, the exact opposite for the number of sites. If you have more sites, you're diluting your signal amongst more different sites. So that's why the peak height in this anomalous difference for you is lower if you have more sites, and it's higher if you have more reflections. Okay, so that's where it's coming from. And then this um, second moment of the anomalous scattering uh, factor. Um, basically, that's saying we're, we're saying that the B value for the anomalously scattering atoms is B, whatever that is. And if it is, then basically the scattering falls off, as I told you before, um, with resolution. So sine squared theta over lambda squared is basically resolution, 1 over resolution squared. So this says if you have a high B value at high resolution, the contribution, the scattering factor, F double prime, gets smaller and smaller at high resolution. And therefore, those atoms don't contribute uh, at high resolution. Okay. Um, so bottom line, and uh, to, I need to explain how this F thing works then. So this is, so if you have a high B factor, what that ends up being is um, at low resolution, your scattering factor is effectively high for these atoms, or, yeah. Um, and at high resolution, it's very low. So there's a big diversity of, in, of scattering factors. And this, the second moment thing, um, basically is one if it's constant with resolution, and it's a smaller than uh, one number, um, I mean, higher than not one number um, if it falls off with resolution. So the more it falls off with resolution, um, the bigger the F number is, and then the whole, and this whole contribution goes down. That's the bottom line. So for purposes of, of thinking about this, just keep in mind, if you have atoms that have a high B factor, they're not going to contribute to high resolution, and therefore um, 
uh, even if you add more res reflections at high resolution, they're getting weighted down by this factor f, and that takes into account. So let's just think about a real, a real example now. Suppose we had perfect data, and we had, um, let's say, 20,000 reflections, and we had, let's say, eight sites. <coughs> then perf if everything were perfect, um, then our anomalous signal would be just a square root of 20,000 over eight. So if we measured a data perfectly, let's say Ciciano was totally perfect, we just take this ratio of those things, square root, and our anomalous signal would be 50. So that's the best possible we could ever get for a data set with 20,000 reflections and eight sites, period, right? But realistically, um, maybe our anomalous correlation overall would be something less than one, and our B factor would be not zero, um, leading to f of some different value, and we might get an anomalous signal of, say, 10 or 12, something that, like that would be more normal. Okay, so we can calculate all those things. That's the point of that. Okay, so, um, so I told you that these equations that I just showed you don't involve anything except the little model that I already showed you, and therefore they ought to just be right. There isn't any, shouldn't be any question about that, but you might doubt me. So this is data showing that more or less these equations have the right information in them. So what I've plotted here is um, the value of the anomalous signal, where I've just calculated that from real data, real model, known sites. Um, so we calculate an anomalous difference for you with real data and real model. And then we look at the known sites and we just say what's the mean value of the peak height at those sites and divide it by sigma. So that's a number. And so that's the, the y-axis is basically looking at the mass. And the x-axis is doing this calculation um, starting with the correlation of anomalous signal with the idealized anomalous signal for that same data set. And that's calculated um, with Phoenix. So we, we plug in where the sites are. We plug in what the structure is. We can calculate the ideal anomalous differences. We can compare the correlation of those ideal anomalous differences with the ones we measured. And that gives that number CC ano. And then we know the number of reflections. We know the number of sites. We know the B values so we can calculate all these things. And that's the x-axis. So the x-axis is calculated with the formula. Y-axis is the real answer. And it's a very good agreement. So it gives me confidence that, yeah, we've done this um, more or less right. And this is with a bunch of different data sets with very highly varying um, resolutions. So that seems fine. So the, the, the math here looks like it's done properly. OK. So to reiterate, um, what's coming into the anomalous signal? And once again, the reason I'm focusing on this is because it's the anomalous signal that determines if I'm going to solve the structure. So what determines it? So the things here are, so anomalous correlation, how similar are my measured anomalous differences to the anomalous differences for an ideal data set with the same, with these anomalously scattering atoms? How many reflections? And it goes to square root of the number of reflections, so that's important. And how many sites? And down is the square root of the number of sites. And um, somebody asked me earlier this morning about the number of sites and are we going to know that in advance. And actually, that's an important fact that typically you don't really know the number of sites. Um, if it's like a selenomethine experiment, you have a pretty good idea of the number of sites. So that's, that's just a number. Um, but if you have um, an iodine soak, you don't know how many. If you have zinc you know, soak or a zinc in, 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 the, in your structure, you might or might not know. And so you could be off potentially by a factor of two um, in the number of sites, which would significantly affect the anomalous signal. Right? So um, this is intrinsically not possible to get the right exact answer from all these things in advance if you don't know how many sites there really are. Okay. And the, the B value for the anomalous substructure, once again, you don't necessarily know that in advance either. Um, if you've measured, if you'd measured the data for um, your crystal, and so you know what the B value overall for your crystal is. We can look at other examples and say, typically, the B value for your anomalously scattering atoms is about 30% higher than the, anomalous, the B value for everybody else. So that's what we find, basically. And so you can use that as a rule of thumb, um, but it doesn't necessarily work for your structure. Maybe your, B, your methionines are all disordered, in which case it's totally hopeless, right? So that's important to understand. Okay. Um, so now, the change gears for a second. Um, so suppose we've collected data and we're trying to find the substructure of anomalously scattering atoms. And so I want to give you a way that's now in Phoenix um, that's extremely powerful um, for doing this. And the concept here is using this uh, likelihood function, a sad likelihood function, um, as the 
um, tool for scoring and extrapolation uh, to find the, the substructure. And here the idea is that um, the likelihood, it you know, sounds complicated. So whenever we talk about the Bayesian stuff, it's, it's always a little bit hard to, to say and hard to understand. But it's actually pretty simple, fundamentally. So here's a definition. The, um, the likelihood, this likelihood function is basically the likelihood, probability, of measuring the observed anomalous data given a particular partial model for describing where the anomalous substructure is, where the anomalously scattering atoms are. So you could, you could make a whole list of different places where the, uh, the anomalous atoms are located. They're located at 653, 2017. You could have a whole list of different coordinates, right? And for each one of those, you could say, how compatible is that set of sites with my measured data? Right? And this is basically asking that question. And it's a formalized way of making that comparison. And the likelihood is a very good way of scoring. And the likelihood further allows you to ask the following question. Let's suppose I have two sites that I think are maybe have something to do with the right answer. And I can ask the question, where can I put a third site in this crystal? And what's the likelihood gain by putting this third site any different possible place? And that turns out to be an extremely good way of finding additional sites. And that's been used for some time. And Gerard Berkonian's group actually introduced that idea um, in, um, with uh, MIR phasing a long time ago. And this is really, the, the, these likelihood functions really encapsulate everything we know. So it's, it's not unreasonable to say they are the most powerful source of information um, because they basically have everything that we understand. So unless we have a different concept of how things work, you can't do much better than this. Okay, so here's, here's, the, here's the actual implement, implementation of this. Um, we, we start with some guess about the anomalous substructure, or many, many, many guesses. And we normally start um, from the Patterson function, uh, which other approaches have, have done as well. So basically, you take your anomalous differences, and you, um, you square them, and you calculate a map, uh, and that map um, is a, a, a kind of a Patterson function, shows vectors between sites. And you can interpret that in a simple way for small numbers of sites to guess um, where sites might be located. So we find two site solutions to the Patterson function, and maybe a long list of those. Um, and then use those as seeds uh, to feed into the likelihood function. So basically, I told you before, if you have a list of possible solutions, you can score them. So, okay, so we can score them all with the sad likelihood function, throw away all the ones that have a low score, take the high ones, and then ask, can we add some more sites to these, and do they increase the likelihood function, build up this way. So um, it's, it is that simple, just what I described. And it works very, very well, it, it, much more powerful than, than, than other methods. And um, so this likelihood, uh, that LLG completion, that's log likelihood gradient completion, that's the method of where can I put a site, uh, a new uh, atom to improve the likelihood. And um, just to for the old timers, this, this whole approach is a, lot, is a lot like doing an anomalous difference Fourier. You, you phase, you get crystal phases, and then you use your anomalous differences and calculate a difference Fourier map, and you pick the peaks and you add them in. Um, but this is a lot better. It basically has a lot more signal because um, it includes kind of everything that we understand about the situation. Okay, so anyways, it works really great. And let me show you some data that says this is true. Um, here's, our, here's our approach. I guess I can't see it very well, but I'll just read it to you. So, um, in, in our hybrid substructure search program in, in, in Phoenix, um, we guess the two site solutions using peaks from Patterson. Um, we extrapolate um, using phasor log likelihood completion. We can also do it with direct methods, and I'll compare those two in a second. Um, and then we score um, with phasor likelihood uh, calculation. You can also score with correlation. Correlation means uh, correlation of uh, structure factors calculated from the anomalous substructure versus anomalous differences, so just that straight correlation. And we can do this um, with a different uh, range of resolutions or not, um, and you can have a variable number of solutions to feed in. You can adjust um, the LLGC sigma is just a, it's a uh, jargon for uh, cutoff for adding in a new solution. So if you, you have a partial solution and then you want to ask, can I put in some more sites? And then you got to have some cutoff for that because if you cut off, if you pick everything in the pos in the, your, your uh, likelihood uh, gradient map, then you'd be adding in a lot of noise things, right? So you normally cut off at like five sigma or something like that. So that's an adjustable parameter. 
So we use the likelihood score to compare solutions. And also, HIST has this nice feature that if you, you find the same solution more than once, it means you're finding the right thing and it can quick, uh, quit. Um, and actually, it takes a little longer than direct methods. So in easy cases, we solve the structures with direct methods the way everybody has been doing for some time. So um, just to show you that this works, um, I'll give you some test cases uh, of doing this. So we took uh, 164 SAD data sets from the protein data bank. And actually, most of these were uh, taken from Joint Center for Structural Genomics data sets that were actually MAD data sets. So they're multi-wavelength. And we just separate them out, this wavelength, that wavelength, that wavelength. So a lot of these had never been solved using SAD data before, right? Because they're like, um, you know, the remote or the inflection or something that didn't have a lot of uh, signal. So we have things that have a lot of signal all the way down to ones that have very little signal as a result of this. And um, yeah, so we used uh, all these different uh, subsets of the, the data. And actually, just one little advertisement. So uh, structural genomics is winding up now. But structural genomics has done a lot for you, has done a lot for everybody. And one of the many things that structural genomics has done for you is that, it pro that many of the structural genomics centers have provided their data, their raw data, um, and made them available to everybody for testing and for development purposes. So we use these things extensively, and the Joint Center has been one of the groups that has done this extremely well. So we use their data for all our development things, and it's really been really terrific. Okay, so here's. Um, plotted as a function of anomalous signal, the way we've defined it, peak height and in anomalous difference Fourier coordinates at the coordinates of the anomalously scattering atoms after you solve the structure. That's, that's the x-axis. And then I've plotted the number of uh, the fraction of the, of the correct sites that are found um, for these different, a whole bunch of different uh, data sets. And this is using the um, direct methods um, in, this, uh, in, this, in this picture. And actually, what I want to conclude a couple of things from this, this picture. One is, um, yes, if you have um, a low anomalous signal, you don't solve the structure. And if you have a high anomalous signal, you do solve the structure. And in between, it's in between. Um, and in, this, in, this, in these data, there are a lot of structures that are, that we haven't found all the sites for sure. Okay, so we do the exact same everything, except we just plug in, instead of the direct methods scoring, we plug in the likelihood-based scoring. Um, and it's a, a lot better. So we've, we've solved many more structures. And, but nevertheless, there's this very sharp cutoff between based on anomalous signal, um, where basically if it's lower than about 10 or something, you basically don't solve the structure. And if it's higher than that, basically you do solve the structure. Now, the minus about this is you don't know that anomalous signal in advance, right? And so the rest, part of the rest of my talk is trying to estimate the numbers for that. Um, but it's clearly, to me, it's clear that the anomalous signal is something that is very closely related to whether or not you're going to actually solve the structure. So let me give you some more data on that, though. So let's, let's um, look at some real uh, uh, recent data. So a couple years ago, uh, Wayne Henriksen's group uh, published a, a paper in Science where they showed that by combining multiple data from multiple crystals, um, you could get uh, sulfur SAD data that was good enough to solve structures. And um, the idea here is, um, can the anomalous signal uh, tell us whether we ought to be able to solve certain data sets? And, and uh, also, can we solve the structure with fewer crystals than they could, well, using the methods I just described? So we'll do both of those things. So this is pretty good uh, data. It goes to 2.3 angstroms. Um, they collected it at 1.74, so this is sulfur SAD. Um, experiment. Um, so here's uh, well, we took so there are seven crystals, and we did basically merge different combinations: one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and different combinations of those. And so each um, so each X or or, or or star there is um, one merged data set. Um, and the x-axis again is anomalous signal of that actual of that merged data set, and the y-axis is the correct number of sites. And here I've just compared um, this LLG uh, likelihood-based method for finding sites with Shell XD in this particular case. Um, and, and, the, I, and this is a kind of a special case. This is very challenging. And so we used a lot of search, uh, searching for Shell XD. And in the LLG, we did with a brute force approach. It's one step beyond what I described to you already. Instead of starting with um, just the sites from the, the Patterson and adding sites one at a time from an LLG map, we start with same from sites from the Patterson again, but then instead of adding them one at a time, we add them two at a time. So we actually 
And the uh, reason for that is by adding two at a time, the increase in likelihood is much, much bigger than adding them one at a time. So the sensitivity is bigger. So, but you have to do a lot more computation because you have to try all combinations of two of pairs of sites. But then you can find things you couldn't find otherwise. So anyways, that we call that brute force. And that works very well. So basically what you're seeing is down to about seven or eight, um, uh, we're able to solve the structures. Below that, we're not able to solve any. Now, to convince you that the anomalous signal is the thing that, that's the right thing to be looking at here, um, oh, this is just uh, showing, uh, doing the same thing by number of crystals merged, showing that um, with the single crystals here, we can't, aren't solving any of the structures. So it couldn't solve it so far. Can't solve any of the structures with one, one crystal. I'll show you that'll be different in a second. Um, but with two crystals, we can solve a lot of them, um, about half of them. And then with three or four or more, we can solve, um, solve it all the time. Um, now, uh, Zio Otanowski helped me out in this uh, a little bit by, um, oh, you know, actually, let's, let's show you one last thing on this before I get to that. So here's showing a merge of two crystals, crystals six and seven. Uh, we take that data set um, and just throw it into Autosol, what we did this morning, um, and it gives a beautiful map. So basically, this is very easy to solve with that, those two uh, crystals, with data from those two crystals. Um, so this is just showing that um, the anomalous signal really is the thing that's important. So this is, what, this is the same data I showed you before, but I've colored it a little bit differently. Um, so the red are all the single data sets, and the blue ones are the ones that are merged data sets. And what we can see is that all the single data sets have very low anomalous signal. It's less than about seven. And none of them can we find the sites. Okay? So, this, so back to Zio Otonowski. So he, I showed this, and then he said, you know, I, I'm sure I can do better. And so, um, so he reprocessed the data. Right? So he took... Um, the exact, he took the raw data for, the, for these, these data sets and he re-ran re it through his latest version of HKL3000. And, and he did improve the anomalous signal. So in the next slide, I'm going to show you the exact same starting data um, and show you the anomalous signal for the data sets when he reprocessed them. And you can see they, they move to the right. And not only do they move to the right, but all the ones that move to the right enough are now solved. So if it's, it is the anomalous signal. This is the thing that tells us whether or not uh, the structure is going to be solved. So now, in, so now we can solve three out of the seven with the single uh, crystal data sets. Tom? Yeah. So can you distinguish between solving the substructure versus being able to build the model into the resulting map? Yes, so I'll try to address that in the second one. Okay. Uh, just, but only at the level of the quality of the phases. And those will be separate things, yes. So when you're saying solve now, you mean the substructure? I mean solve the substructure. And um, yes, and so once you solve the substructure, then the thing that's going to determine whether you're going to phase it actually is a little bit complicated. It's, it is how, how good are the phases, and plus how much solvent you have, how much NCS do you have. And so those, those second two things, I haven't really merged into this yet. But it's a really good point. The single data set was essentially complete? Yes. Yeah. So it's not a completeness issue. It's just redundancy. It's a, that's exactly right. It's just a redundancy issue. So how, do you, how do you break the uh, ambiguities? In this case, there, there aren't any ambiguities uh, to speak of. Uh, maybe you're asking, how do you orient the crystals relative to each other? Um, and you do that um, by asking what orientation, what indexing, um, gives the highest correlation between crystals. In this case, there wasn't any problem. I didn't have to do anything. But um, in general, that's the, the approach. And that's the same approach for XFL experiments that people use. OK. And so this is just showing with one crystal, we can solve that structure just fine, too. OK. And then here's another example of the same thing I mentioned about um, merging multiple crystal data from multiple crystals. And I'll show you a couple slides on this. Um, and this one is some data from um, Janet Smith and David Akey, where they, they have um, uh, 26 crystals that they merged together to, uh, to do a sulfur SAD experiment. Um, and this is just showing you, um, so I merged these data um, in, I think this is a random order experiment. Uh, merged the data um, for one crystal, two crystals, three crystals, et cetera. And I've plotted for those merged data the anomalous signal of those merged data sets. And what I'm just showing you here is that um, unless you get all the way up to the right-hand side here, the highest anomalous signal, you can't solve the substructure. And um, actually, this is a little bit cautionary. This says if they had a, just a few fewer uh, crystals there, they'd, <laughs> this wouldn't have worked. Yeah, okay. 
So that, that was pretty close. Okay, so phasing with weak signal, we're trying to get part to, to Bob's, Bob's question. Um, and this is, the only, this is my only answer to your question right now. Is, um, so this is the same set of uh, SAD data sets um, from 1.5 to 4.5 angstrom resolution. And um, I'm plotting here on the x-axis this um, the correlate the CCANO, the correlation between measured anomalous differences and uh, idealized anomalous differences. So this is the useful anomalous correlation. And the y-axis is the experimental map correlation. So we're just taking non-densely demodified maps. So each data set, we're going to, we take the, uh, in this case, the correct sites, um, we calculate phases with them, um, and we compare the anomalous correlation with how good the maps are. And the only one thing I want you to conclude from this is that, yes, um, the anomalous correlation has a lot to do um, with how good the maps are going to be. And um, so if your anomalous correlation is very low, your map is going to be pretty noisy. And if your anomalous correlation is very high, your map is going to be pretty good if you can find the substructure in the beginning. Okay. Um, it's not a perfect correlation. It's not so nice as some of the others, but it, it's definitely there. Um, so. Yeah, that's the end of what we're gonna, I'm going to say on the, on the phasing aspect of it. And as I said, it's, it is important to recognize that density modification and NCS are really crucial um, later. Okay, so now let's talk about um, trying to estimate this anomalous. So I, I hope I convinced you that the anomalous signal is the thing that determines if you're going to be able to solve it in the first place. So can we estimate the numbers? And this is coming to the tools that I showed you this morning. So just to remember, so the thing that matters, things that matter, useful anomalous correlation, number of reflections, and then divided by number of sites and this um, factor depending on the B value. So that's what's going to determine how high our anomalous signal is. And then, so this is just to remind me to say that, um, yeah, sure, if your, your data are not accurately measured, then surely your anomalous correlation is going to go down. Um, and that's just all that shows this. The, the x-axis is a kind of normalized uh, mean square measurement error, where in this, it's normalized in such a way that one means you have no, no information at all. And uh, zero means you've measured everything perfectly. And the CC ano, that's the useful anomalous correlation. So that makes sense that that decreases. You have to measure your data accurately if you want to get uh, be able to measure your anomalous signal. OK, so before we're measuring, the, collecting the data, what, how can we estimate these different things? So the anomalous correlation is crucial for this, right? If you have no anomalous correlation, you have no signal at all. And so how are we going to guess that? We're going to guess it before doing the experiment. From, um, from what we think the I over sig I is going to be. So we're going to say, I'm going to measure my I over sig I of ratio of 100 to 1. Um, then that gives you an idea of how big the sigmas are in your measurements. And that gives you an idea of the best possible, at least, value you could get for your useful anomalous correlation. So that's where that one's coming from. The number of reflections and the number of sites, we're going to guess these from the sequence. And as I pointed out before, the guessing number of sites could be pretty far off. And then the B value for the anomalous substructure, um, we're going we're gonna to say my data diffracts to a resolution of two angstroms, I think. And typical crystals that were diffract to two angstroms usually have a B value of about 30. And so therefore, it's going to be 30. And actually, we'll add on a little bit because this is the anomalously scattering one is 30% bigger. So mine's going to be 38 or whatever. Okay? So that's basically how that calculation goes. Um, and then we're just going to plug in. So that's, that's how that one works. And so here's how good it is. Um, for the same data sets I talked about. So each data set, um, we're going to take the things that we did know in advance, um, plus we're going to use the resolution, we're going to plug in the resolution of this data set. Um, and so we had our sequence, and our resolution, um, and, what, and how many sites there are. No, we're going to guess the sites from the sequence. So every, only things that we knew in advance. So the x-axis is what we predict the anomalous signal to be. Um, based on just these things as I described, and the y-axis is how big it really is. And so, yeah, it's not that great, um, but in fact, we can identify the ones that are really bad, that had no hope, and we can identify the ones that are sure things, and the ones in the middle, they're in the middle. And of course, maybe in your real case, most of them are going to be in the middle, and that's a, that's a minus. Okay, so, oops. All right, so now what if we, uh, oh, scaling emerging data. So I made some claims about this. I want to describe a little bit more about how this works. So, so we have multiple crystals or just one crystal with multiple measurements of, of intensities. And we would like to combine our observations of six observations of, 
of this I plus and six ops raised to this I minus in some smart way so that we can measure the optimally get our anomalous differences. That's the goal, okay? And so, the, and so our key idea here is to try to describe what the sources of error are and then use those to do smart weighting of the whole system. So that's, there's no more to it than that. Um, and so here our, our, our model is that we have the main sources of, uh, of differences between F plus and, and F minus, um, aside from the actual anomalous differences, are errors in measurement and that the crystals really are different. And neither of these are interesting in this context of what is my actual anomalous difference. So those are both noise. Um, so here's our, our, our tricks. Our one, we're going to use local scaling, as I described this morning, to reduce systematic errors. And we're going to estimate the, the variances between crystals, and we're going to use that in weighting. And that's pretty much the whole trick. And just to reiterate the local scaling idea, in case you didn't get it when I was trying to explain it this morning. So um, things like absorption through the crystal and decay uh, tend to affect neighboring reflections in the same way. And so decay, that's true for because typically at low resolution, there's not so much decay. At high resolution, there's more decay. So your neighbors kind of give an idea of what's happening to you. So then the idea is um, to calculate, uh, if you want to scale a structure factor or HKL from crystal 1 to crystal 2, we're going to calculate the mean amplitude or intensity for each of the crystals using a small sphere of resolution, or a sphere of reflections, and in fact, excluding, not including the one reflection that we're interested in, so it doesn't get included in the scale factor, and then we apply that scale factor to one of the crystals. So that's, that's it. It's very simple to do, um, and that's implemented, implemented in, in, in Phoenix and Solve. Okay, and then the inter-data set uh, averaging, so after we've uh, scaled each data set and you have 25 different, 25 different measurements of each intensity. Um, we're just going to assume that, again, the anomalous differences for a crystal differ um, from the average one uh, by something coming from the measurement errors and the intercrystal variation. Um, and this little formula allows us to estimate this intercrystal variation. So if we just take, so this is, this is actually how we, we, we're going to calculate um, sigma squared crystal. We're gonna we're gonna measure. We're gonna we know delta anode. That's our uh, our our measurement for reticular reflection. Delta average is the average for all the reflections, and the square of the difference between those. So basically, how much variation there is um, is going to be come partly from the experimental sigmas, uh, experimental errors, which we have idea about how big they are, and from from the crystal. So whatever is left over after the errors, that's how big the sigma squared crystal is. So that's how we estimate the sigma squared crystal. Then we just use that um, in the average procedure. So then our weighting from individual crystal comes from sigma squared observed and the sigma squared for the crystal. And they're both res and it's resolution dependent. So that's the formula and it's really easy to implement too. And this is just to convince you that it does something. Um, so this plot shows We've taken data from the PDB where people nominally have already scaled the data and they've already done their best job. And um, so we can compare the anomalous differences from that data uh, to the idealized um, anomalous differences for that structure. And we can do a correlation of that. So that's the x-axis and that's the CC ano. So useful anomalous correlation for the original data is the x-axis. And then after just taking the exact same data and just applying local, uh, the scaling procedure to it is the y-axis. And so the, how far the dots are off that line basically shows how much better it is um, using this procedure than just what was there. So it helps. It's very, very useful and very easy to do. Um, I'll skip these two. Uh, another nice thing about this procedure is since it estimates the intercrystal variation, it doesn't really matter if you include a particular data set or not because it will, if it doesn't belong there, it will get weighted down. If it does belong there, it gets weighted in. So it's nice that way. And um, this is just illustrating that um, with some data from, again, from, the, from Janet Smith and David Akey. Um, they had, when they solved this structure, what they had to do was carefully select the right subset of data sets and merge them together, and then they could solve the structure. And this just shows you that if you just pick them in a random order and just keep adding data sets in, um, this is looking at a particular subset of reflections. Basically, it, gener it still improves even if you add in more or less random, uh, or add them in random order. Um, so 
uh, as opposed to as you add in bad data sets, then they get much, much, much worse. Yeah, I won't go into the, the lines there, that, except to mention that um, according to a very simple theory, if you collected infinity number of data sets, you'd get up to that red dotted line up there. Okay, so now after we've collected our data, what, what would all this look like? Okay, so after you collect the data, the anomalous correlation, we can estimate that one much better now, right? Because we, we have an estimate from the half data set anomalous correlation, so we kind of know how that works. And as I mentioned, there's some other... Um, uh, things we can look at from the data themselves that gives estimates of the anomalous correlation. And one of them is just looking at what the errors in measurement are. We can do some estimate that way. In the skew, I'll just mention that you can calculate an anomalous difference Patterson function. An anomalous difference Patterson function is supposed to show peaks at differences between coordinates of the, of the anomalous the scattering atoms. And if you have a totally random map or totally random data, you know, that map will just be noise everywhere. But if you have real atoms somewhere, you'll get big peaks in that map. And if you have big peaks in the map, then the skewness of the map goes up. So bottom line is, that's actually a pretty good measure as well of the quality of um, anomalous differences. So the skewness of that map is helpful. Okay, so then uh, number of reflections, now we know that. We measured them. And number of sites, that one we still don't know. And so that's a limitation even at this point. Um, you don't know how many sites there are, so it, you, we can't absolutely calculate that anomalous signal. Um, but we can guess them from the sequence file again. And then the B values again, um, we don't know the B values for the anomalously subscattering atoms. We know the B values for everybody else and we can guess them. So now we can plug into there and um, so how well does this work? So, um, so now we're estimating the anomalous signal um, using information that is available after you have collected the data but not using any other information. So I'm not using the number of sites in this picture here, for example. I'm using, we're guessing the number of sites here, just as you really would in, before you solve the structure. So the x-axis now is how big the anomalous signal is that we would estimate after having collected the data, but without having solved the structure, and the actual anomalous signal on the y-axis. And now it's pretty good. So we have a pretty good idea of how, that, how big that anomalous signal is, but there's, you know, it's not perfect still. So, but we have a lot more information. Okay, so then finally, uh, on this, um, okay, will I, should I be able to solve this structure? And another way to ask, turn this into is, how hard should I be working on trying to solve this structure given this data? Right? Okay, um, so before before we've solved, before we've um, collected the data, um, I showed the thing on the left. Just this is just to remind you. So now we're just putting everything together to say what is the probability that I will actually find this substructure? So the x-axis is the estimated P of substructure that I showed you this morning. So for the same set of data sets, before measuring any data, um, what's my estimated probability that I will solve the structure? Um, and those numbers range from like 20 to 90% here. And then the y-axis is the percentage of the substructure that was actually found for that particular data set. Uh, and the red line is the mean, is a, a smooth mean uh, for this, showing that yes, if we estimate the probability to be low, it is low. I mean, if we estimate the probability to be high, it is high, but low and high do not guarantee failure and success, right? It's just a probability. Okay. So then, a lot of them work, even if there's low probability. that's right. So that says there's a lot of cases. So even if um, the probability is low, don't totally give up because there's always a chance it's going to work. Yeah, and, it, and so that's why it only goes down to 20 percent because even if it's estimated. Even the anomalous signal is estimated as zero. There's, you still have a 20% chance that it's going to solve. So, you know, I, it'd be nicer if it didn't turn out that way. But okay, that's that's the way it is. So that, that this is just the answer, right? And then so here's so this that's before collecting data. This is after collecting the data. Um, and so once again, you still don't have um, a zero percent chance of solving a structure um, ever. Um, and it's just a little bit more accurate now after collecting the data than it was before. So now if, you, if it says you have an 80 or 90 percent chance of solving a structure, you have a really, I mean, it is 80 percent, 90 chance. So you're, you can be happy it's probably going to solve it. Um, so how do you turn that into um, what you want to do? Well, I think that, um, you know, if it says there's a, suppose there's, it says there's a 20 percent chance or a 2 percent chance of solving a structure and you don't solve it, um, I wouldn't work that hard at it. You know, try a few things, don't not do it, right? But it's, you know, it's probably not going to happen. But if it says there's like 80 or 90% chance you should solve it and you don't solve it, 
That means look for systematic problems in the data um, and try very hard and, and it should be solvable, right? Either solvable or else you should be able to track down what's wrong. So that, that's the utility of the tool there. Okay. Um, so just a couple minutes to the end here on um, just the, the tools that we, we saw um, and what, what we can do for automatic structure solution for using a sad phasing kind of approach. So basically we have um, the autosol tool that we saw this morning for finding the substructure, phasing, density modification, preliminary model building, and then auto building uh, for iterative model building, refinement, and density modification. And then there's another version of auto building that's parallel that basically takes, it runs out of auto build and a bunch of parallel things. Um, and then averages the maps from those, and those maps are better than any individual map, and then you iterate the whole process. So it just takes more computation, but you can pull out things that are uh, more challenging. And um, so the, the place where the LLG things come in here, uh, so our standard autosol, we're starting with experimental data, sequence, atom, and wavelength. That's what we typed in this morning. We find the heavy atom sites, calculate phases, improve phases. Um, also, we find the NCS from the density or from the sites or from a model, build a model, and then we um, can iterate back um, using the, um, the map and model in that LLG completion process. So the LLG uh, the likelihood process says, how compatible is my model, initially just heavy atoms, anomalous sites, with my data? But if you have some more information, like suppose you have a model or suppose you have a map that represents the model, now your model for the, the scattering is not just the sites, but it's the sites plus the model. So now the, the, the model or density map puts a lot more restriction on what sites are going to be allowable. And so you can feed this back in to iterate the process. And this morning, Paul mentioned um, MRSAD um, approach, which is actually the same idea. It's you have a model. Maybe it came from MR. Instead of cycling back here, you come in from molecular replacement using that model plus your anomalous data constrains the possibilities for where the sites are much more than without that model. So all these are ways to bring in this information to improve the, the finding of sites and finding of small sites. So here's just showing that all this works pretty well. Um, this is a 164 uh, sad data sets from the PDB, uh, many of the same ones that I mentioned before. And this is um, out of cell before making any um, uh, improvements uh, and, and plotted a versus anomalous signal, and this is the final map correlation, basically how good the map and model are after autosol. And so we solve a lot of these, depends on anomalous signal. Um, if we include the new version of a uh, recent version I just told you about, about finding sites with uh, likelihood, we find a lot more sites and get a lot better solution than we did before. Um, after auto building, this improved further, and after parallel auto building, it's improved. Um, even further. And once again, the anomalous signal is the thing that, with you know, one example that is, fails, um, that really determines whether or not it's going to solve and generally how good, good things are, are going to be. Um, so to, to finish then, uh, so the, the thing that's going to determine whether you're going to solve the structure is, um, your, is your anomalous signal. And, um, this can, be, this can be estimated, and likelihood-based methods for finding the substructure are, are very powerful, even with a, a weak signal. And you can solve your structure, um, even with a, a very weak signal. And um, as Paul mentioned, this, all this stuff's a team effort um, of many people um, in Phoenix. And in this particular work, um, Paul's group and our group and Randy Reed's group all collaborated a lot uh, to make all the things that I uh, talked about possible. Thanks. So you can use the uh, substructure to uh, see w uh, where the uh, NC to find out the NCS, right? Uh, yes. So, well, in in part. So yes and no. So you can't. It's not very easy to just use the substructure to identify the NCS. You can't just do that typically because normally, if you look, so you can look at the substructure and find like little triangles, atom, 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 and there's another similar one here, similar one there, and those often represent NCS. Um, you can't only do that um, because there are often, often many substructures like that that follow NCS that are incorrect. Um, so normally what we do um, is guess them that way um, and then test whether the density in these different regions does reflect, is similar in each case, and in then case call it 
um, actual NCS. That works is turns out to be much more powerful than just by itself. How about the solvent region? Can you infer the solvent region mm -hmm. from this uh, substructure to? Uh, can you infer the solvent region from the substructure? Uh, this is a very interesting question. So the answer, uh, I don't know how to do that, but here's some things that you, you could do. So um, the substructure is not in the solvent. So you, you do know that. Right. Because if it were in the solvent, it wouldn't be ordered. So you can exclude anything that's in the substructure from being in the solvent. So that's, that's a start there, right? And um, you know maybe you could go a little further, even without any maps, you could say, you know, if, you, if there's a lot of substructures, like a lot of seleniums or something, you might be able to say, you know, kind of this region has got things and that. Um, I think it would be hard, though, because things are pretty well packed a lot of the time. And so just differentiating, just from the points of where the atoms are, differentiating where molecules are, I think would be hard. So it's possible, though. But, and you can definitely get partway. Yeah. So, so yeah, the, you've obviously made it a lot of progress moving your curve to, to the right there, I mean, more salt structures, right? But the uh, SpaceX uh, lesson is that you can also move your curve quite a bit to the right if you're a, a professional data processor. That's or, right. So uh, what, what does he know how to do that the other people didn't? They were probably also not slashing. Well, and, and, you know, yeah. How do you get the curve to the right with data processing? Yeah, so I don't know the answer, but here's my guess. So th there's two things happening here. One is, so Zio's very good at, at the data processing, right? He's going to get his parameters as good as anybody can, right? So he's going to get his spots matching everything perfect. So he's going to do that step very, very well. And um, other people probably could do that, but it might take a whole lot longer to do it. Um, and then second, he, he has a version of his um, software that takes into account some things that others have not taken into account uh, previously. Namely, um, he's, he has a model in his, that we don't have available to us, you don't have it, that has a model in there for radiation decay um, and for absorption that's, so that it's taking into account the whole data collection so process. Development version of that's right, HKL, not that's right. The rest of us have. Yes, so two things happening. We'd, hard to tell which one is the most important. Yeah, Bob. B.C. Wang did a lot of this early on, and I think he checked out a lot of beam lines and found a big difference in the quality of the data based on the experimental setup. So that's also a, perhaps a contribution. It's a major contribution. I, I say less than in the older days. Mm -hmm. um, I think the beam lines have generally been getting much, much better. Um, but yeah, there, there's clearly a, a, a systematic aspect of data collection of different beam lines that some are generally set up better than others. And these have to, you know, these have to do with a lot of things. Um, until recently, and maybe even, even currently, has, one of the things has to do with um, uh, intensity of beam, uh, shutter opening, um, and things like that having to do with uh, as you collect your data, and you, and you think you did a rotation of one half degree, and you think, that, and you assumed that there was uniform dose through that one half degree, and that wasn't a true statement. That made your data not be good, and so that that had a lot to do with why a lot of the beam lines didn't work very well. I think, also just alignment problems, and a lot of them had had to do had uh, problems in the same same respect. So there's many things that that definitely feed into this. It's very very true. Oh, we got one more back here. Yeah, I didn't really um, explain that very well. Let me try to make it succinctly. Is that uh, the anomalous signal just depends on number of reflections, anomalous correlation, number of sites, B factor, with the proviso that you're talking about the entire data set, whatever that is. So, bottom line is, suppose at a particular resolution, two angstroms, you get a certain number for anomalous signal. And then we add in data to, say, 1.5. And we're asking our question, what's the effect of the additional resolution, right? And then my answer to you there is, um, if the B value is relatively small, so that those high resolution reflections are contributing significantly, and if you measure the data accurately, so that the Cesiano doesn't change too much, then you're going to get 
the effect of those additional re reflections in your anomalous signal will go up substantially. If, on the other hand, that your high resolution data is measured very inaccurately, it contributes zero. Or if there's a very high B factor for the anomalously scattering atoms, it contributes zero as well. So that's the bottom line is you get an advantage of high resolution if you can take advantage of it through accurate data and there's a, a low B factor. It's the same story that if it's, it, to four angstrom, so if you have a if your B value for anomalously scattering atom is 150, um, then maybe you can collect the data of four angstroms, um, and if you collected it to two, you get no advantage because it's not scattering there. All right, thanks, Tom. Okay.